Nikki, should we go ahead and get started? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's wonderful to have everybody with us. Looks like we have about 89 people here uh, so far. So um, I just wanted to take a moment, go over some logistics and introduce your presenter. Um, so quick notes, uh, except for the presenter, everybody is muted. Um, after the talk, when it's time for the Q&A, I can turn on the ability to unmute yourself so you can ask questions. Uh, you can also ask questions in the chat, which I see lots of people using already. So that's great. You can use that throughout the presentation. Um, I posted a link to the full conference schedule in the chat. So uh, check that out. Uh, join us for the rest of the sessions if you can. Um, and that said, I'll go ahead and introduce your presenter today. Um, Melissa Wong is an adjunct instructor with the School of Information Sciences at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she teaches courses in instruction, e-learning, and higher education. She's the author of Instructional Design for LIS Professionals, which is a guide for LIS faculty, and is co-author of Instruction in Libraries and Information Centers, an introduction a new open access textbook on library instruction. So please join me in welcoming Melissa Wong. Nikki, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and I appreciate you being here as the moderator as well. We're going to start this session with a land acknowledgement. And I should clarify that while I teach for the University of Illinois, I actually teach in their distance education program. And so I live in Los Angeles. So I'd like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that the University of Illinois is on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Miskouten, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Chickas and Chickasaw Nations. Where I live in Los Angeles is the traditional territory of the Keech tribe. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As scholars, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of our institutions and communities. I'd also like to thank the University of Arizona for sponsoring the CLAPS conference and the CLAPS committee for their incredible work uh, putting together this entire conference and then doing all of that work a second time to move it online. I'm really excited that the committee decided to open up the conference to everyone who wanted to attend because I think this is really a fantastic opportunity and I welcome all of you here and I'm so glad to see you this afternoon. A special shout out to my current and former students who are here. It is great to see you. Um, I wish that we were together in person so I could take you out for coffee and um, I still owe four of you the lunch that we were supposed to have in Tucson back in March. But my presentation today has been shaped by countless interactions with students over the years and I want to acknowledge what a privilege it has been been to work with um, all of you, all of them, and thank you for the stories and ideas and the feedback that you have shared with me because it's made me both a better teacher and again really influenced my thinking about accessibility. Um, so we have an hour together today and I would invite everybody to use the chat at any time. I really like a robust chat. It kind of lets me know how people are responding to what I'm saying. And um, I often will pause to respond to questions. But I do have some dedicated Q&A time at the end. And so if I miss your question in the chat, please don't take that to mean I didn't think it was a good question. It just means that I missed it um, or couldn't stop right at that moment. And so you can, there will be time that you can repeat your question at the end of the session. Um, I also wanna say I have my camera on because I know that some people like that sense of connection to a speaker. If it, if you like to watch me talking, you can. Um, but also I really encourage you to keep your camera off. There's, there's no reason you have to be online right now. If you wanna turn it on during the discussion, you're welcome to, um, but I think we're all experiencing some Zoom fatigue. And um, as we'll talk about later in this session, there's a lot of reasons to let people leave their cameras off. So please don't feel that you need to be on camera with me today because you do not. 
Um, also throughout the talk, I will mention some various resources and authors. And I wanted to let you know, um, first of all, Paige is here. Paige Crawl has been doing amazing work in all the sessions I've attended. Um, putting all the resources in the chat. She's like amazing at how fast she can do it. Um, but there is a resource list in this Google folder and it should have the things that I mentioned. And if I mention anything else that's not on that list, I'll add it when the session is over. Um, and then there's also a copy of the slides. So if you wanna take a look at the slides later, you can. I also put a lot of my speaking notes into the notes field. So if you wanna remind yourself of something, or um, if you want to share the slides with somebody, there will be a recording, but there are also some pretty good notes in there for you, okay? Okay, so with that, let's get started. Um, so my talk today is titled, Extensions for Everyone, Syllabus Policies that Center Accessibility. And in order to talk about accessibility, we first need to talk about disability and accommodations. So 11% of undergraduate students have a disability. Um, that number is closer to 5% if you're working with graduate students. But of those undergraduate students who have a disability, only 23% of them request accommodations. So only 23% of our students on campus who have a disability, theoretically need accommodations, are asking for those accommodations or getting those accommodations. And in order to understand why only 23% of students are requesting that accommodations, it is helpful to understand what that accommodations process looks like on most of our campuses. So typically what happens is that a student registers with the institution as having a disability. Um, they register with an office on campus, an administrator in that office determines what accommodations the institution will offer, such as extended time on a test or receiving potential extensions on assignments. The administrator puts those accommodations in writing, and then the student has to take that written document, that letter, to each individual faculty member for the courses they're taking to arrange for accommodations. And that process presents some barriers. So number one, students have to have documentation of their disability from a medical professional, usually fairly recent documentation. And that process can be both time consuming and expensive. Then students have to navigate campus systems for requesting accommodations. And that can be really challenging for students who are new to campus and have never gone through that process before. Um, or if one of the manifestations of their disability is difficulty with executive functioning, right? That's another barrier. So I saw that comment, like this becomes another form of gatekeeping, right? Um, I think Amy's comment that students may not even realize that something they're dealing with counts as a disability is a, is a possibility. Um, I have also worked with graduate students who weren't diagnosed until they were adults with a disability. So they may, we definitely will have students who don't even recognize they have a disability. Um, but another barrier in this process is that it requires that students disclose their private medical information to campus administrators. Technically, they do not have to disclose that information to faculty, but they are disclosing that they have a disability, right? Even if they're not disclosing the specifics. And understandably, many students do not want to do that. Um, also, there can be a real stigma to having a disability, particularly if it's an invisible disability like a chronic illness or a learning disability. Um, both of those are, are very misunderstood. They can come with a lot of stigmas. Um, around, you know, work ethic, intelligence, that kind of thing. Um, so many students have had negative experiences with teachers in the past. They are very afraid of being stigmatized by faculty or leaders in their program or their peers. And so they simply don't ask for the accommodations. Yep. And all these comments in the chat about other barriers are really, really fantastic. Um, so 
Um, Jay Dolman, who's a fantastic writer and speaker about disability in higher education, points out that this accommodations model, which is supposed to provide, you know, equity and inclusion, becomes itself a barrier for our students with disabilities. Um, and I've been talking a lot about the the formal classroom, right, a credit course and a syllabus and a faculty member. But I want to say that all of this is true for those of us who teach in libraries, who do information literacy instruction. And in fact, I would say my experience as a librarian is that um, I'm even less likely to have a student come to me for accommodations for an information literacy workshop, right? So we have to keep in mind that anytime we're in class, there are going to be a lot of students who have a disability and who may, even if there is not a formal request for accommodations. So that takes us to this concept of universal design. Universal design comes from, um, it begins with architecture and product design. And it stresses designing spaces and products that can be useful, can be used by the widest variety of people. It is this very proactive approach to accessibility and inclusion, where we don't wait for somebody to request something, but we create accessible spaces. So a great example of this would be curb cuts, right? We put, we now, when we do new, um, it, when we do new construction for roads and intersections, or when we remodel roads and, inter and intersections, we put in curb cuts. Um, elevators are a great example. Sliding doors are a great example. If you've ever used OXO tools, those kitchen tools with the really um, kind of big black cushy handles, those were designed for accessibility. They're designed for people with either fine motor control challenges or arthritis. Now, the beauty of universal design is this idea it can be used by lots and lots of people. So all kinds of people benefit from curb cuts, right? Um, people who are pushing strollers, people who are riding bicycles or scooters who are on rollerblades, people, uh, delivery people benefit from curb cuts. So universal design, again, is this idea of proactive design, thinking about the how we can design spaces and products to be usable by the widest variety of people. In education, we implement universal design by asking instructors to create accessible course materials. So using high contrast colors on flyers and handouts, adding alt text to our slides and presentations, adding captions to our videos, that's all universal design, right? Another application is universal design for learning. Um, and universal design for learning takes the idea of universal design and it applies it to pedagogy in the classroom. And I'm not going to talk a lot about UDL, but I do have some resources on the resource list if you are not familiar with the idea of universal design. I would recommend starting with CAST, C-A-S-T. It's an organization that uh, created the universal design for learning framework and has some great resources to get you started. Um, so universal design for learning emphasizes using varied pedagogical strategies giving students choices in the classroom, particularly in learning activities and assignments, and then attending to course climate and student motivation. But I'd like to take a step back from thinking about our pedagogy and our instructional materials and our learning activities and suggest that if we want a truly inclusive course, it starts with our classroom policies. Um, those are the policies that are in our syllabi or in the case of information literacy instruction, the kind of expectations we have when students enter our classroom. Um, because our policies can create this inaccessible classroom environment where students either have to seek formal accommodations with all the challenges that that entails or forego their accommodations and potentially struggle to be successful. And in the true spirit of universal design, 
um, I'm going to suggest that when we create more flexible classroom policies that start to negate the need for formal accommodations, we are actually creating a more inclusive classroom environment for all kinds of students. So here is an example from my own teaching. Um, let's talk about late work policies. I am sure that all of us as current or former students have seen classroom policies around late work similar to the ones that I have on this slide, which I easily found with a little Google search, right? Um, students have to meet the deadline, and if they don't, there are really dire consequences because late work will not be accepted or it will be severely penalized. This leads us to what I think is the most common accommodation request I get when I get these formal letters um, from students. And this is the language they use at the University of Illinois. It is exactly the same on every single letter. The student, when experiencing an exacerbation of their disability related condition, should be granted permission to make up assignments within a reasonable period of time after the due date and without penalty. And again, this is one that I see on a regular basis with students, but it's only necessary because faculty have these really draconian policies around late work, right? We wouldn't need these policies if our classroom, po we wouldn't need these accommodation policies if our classroom policies were more flexible. And so here is the policy that I use, one that I think is much more inclusive for all students around late work. So I tell my students, assignments are due by the end of the day stated in the syllabus. I clarify for them that means midnight because it's a distance education program. And then I say, I'm not upgrading at midnight because I am not. Um, so you have an automatic grace period until the next morning. If you need an extension beyond that, please email me with an explanation and an estimate of when you can complete the work. And that's it. That's my late work policy. I tell them I pretty much can always offer an extension and I'm not really worried about it. Um, but they just have the obligation to let me know. So, um, and I will say, um, I know sometimes people struggle with this because my policy is very open ended, but you certainly can do variations on this. So whereas I require that students notify me, I have seen other faculty who give students a longer grace period. So they'll say, you know, up, you can have up until three extra days to complete an assignment. Um, I have seen faculty who put a limit. So they say you can turn in up to two things late um, and that way students don't have to request it they can just sort of use those late passes when they need them so there are some different ways to implement this more flexible policy but it has a lot of benefits it does not require that students disclose a disability i do still have students who send me their paperwork but they don't have to um, and they certainly don't have to have an official accommodation to be able to get an extension on their work in keeping with universal design it benefits all students so students who get sick who one of their family members is ill, who have a family emergency, even if they just have a really heavy workload that week. I have students who sometimes use this extension so that they can focus on one assignment and they just turn mine in a couple of days later, right? But it benefits all students. It is also much more equitable because I'm telling students up front what the policy is. It doesn't rely on a student asking for special treatment. Um, which we know that some students feel comfortable asking, whereas other students, particularly first generation students or students who have anxiety, are probably not going to ask for what they see as special treatment because they're not sure if it's appropriate or they don't feel confident doing that. So this way it's very equitable that everybody knows how they can get an extension whenever they need it. Um, I will also tell you as a faculty member, it's a lot less stressful because I don't need to make a decision about whether or not to grant an extension, whether it's fair or reasonable, because I've already made a decision, which is everybody can have an extension if they just reach out and let me know that they need one, right? So the connection to critical pedagogy. 
you know, at their best, our classroom policies should clarify our expectations for students. They can bring structure to a class and they can support an effective learning environment, right? So very often we are well intentioned when we create classroom policies, but policies can all too easily become these instruments of control where the instructor has all the power and students have none. Critical pedagogy asks us to share power in the classroom, right? It, it asks us to give students agency as learners to be able to make their own decisions about their learning. And I think that these flexible course policies come from a place of respecting and trusting our learners that our students want to learn and that they're motivated and that they know best how to balance their personal work and academic lives. And so I really see flexible policies as decreasing barriers to education and supporting equity in the classroom in, in multiple ways. So what I'd like to do next is brainstorm what kinds of what other course policies might create barriers to education barriers in the classroom. Um, and I actually have a poll that we can do. And then what I thought we might do after the brainstorming is we'll just pick a couple of things from the brainstorm to unpack a little bit further and talk about why those things might create barriers and what a flexible alternative might look like. So we're going to use Menti. And I think, hold on one second. I'm going to paste in a link. I think that link, oops, sorry, somebody messaged me privately. So of course now it thinks I want to reply to her privately. So let me go back up. Oh, Zoom, I love you. All right, I think that will work for you. But if it doesn't, I am also going to screen share and you'll see the link and the code at the top of the screen. So give me, actually tell me if that link is working for you. Okay, great. So you can put that in, give me just a minute and I will um, screen share the replies. But I'll give you a minute to think and put a few ideas in there and then I'll do that. Bye Maria, it was good to see you. These are great. And I think with the screen sharing, you should now be able to see the answers that I'm seeing, but let me know if that is in fact the case. No, okay, hold on. Okay, how's that, better? Thanks. Oh, these are so good. So I'm seeing some attendance ones. I'm seeing lateness. Um, I saw at least one about video. And I think that would be a great one for us to discuss today because it's so relevant to the work we're all doing with virtual education right now. Uh, I see somebody said no technology, which I love because that's also on my list, which is this idea of device bans and why those are so problematic.
<laughs> Veronica, the device band one is interesting too, right? Because now with um, everything going online, I, teachers have a lot less control over what students have access to. This might be a good thing. These are really great. I'm going to give us about another 30 seconds. Nancy uh, just asked if I would share the results and I was thinking the same thing. Um, Nancy, don't use my lot, but I assume there's a way for me to download the results and I will figure that out and then I will put it in that same Google folder, okay? And I would say not all of these are policy related, but all of them are great considerations for accessibility. Um, that can be fixed by better spaces, better pedagogy. These are all really, really great. Yeah, doctor's notes, right? I saw somebody said this idea of, of students being properly dressed for Zoom sessions. Um, and I don't know how many people saw this, but there was a conversation on Twitter about a teacher who required that students wear shoes. And I thought, and the big conversation was, A, how do you know if your students are wearing shoes while they're sitting at their laptop? But why, how does this help them do better in class? And it's incredibly cultural. Um, not everybody wears shoes in their house. And why do you care? That's what I wonder sometimes about people. Why do you care? Okay, we're going to stop with this survey. Um, again, these are fantastic. I love these and I can't wait until after our session because I'd like to go back and look at some of them in more detail. But I need to get out of this or I will be completely distracted by your fantastic replies. And like I said, I will grab those results and I will put them in the, um, put them in that Google folder for folks who want to go through them at their leisure because there's a lot to think about in those results. So thank you for that. So let's unpack a couple of these. Let's start with um, let's start with the doctor's notes. That was a great one that I saw people bringing up. Well, how do these create a barrier? We sometimes see when students are sick, they're going to miss class. The faculty member wants a doctor's note. Right. So it's expensive. Um, students may not have health insurance to be able to visit the doctor. And even if you do, sometimes there is a small charge for a doctor's note. You may not, you know, if our students are in a residential undergraduate experience, they may not have a local doctor that they can go to. They may not, it may be difficult to get in the same day. It, um, Right, so there's all these things there. Also, I think as um, I think I saw Diamond point this out, and others may have as well. We're really it's very paternalistic to assume that our students need a doctor to tell them that they are too sick to come to class. Can't we trust our students to decide if they are too sick to come to class? Right? Like, let's, yes, let's give them some agency over their own bodies and their own ability to make decisions. We don't need a doctor to tell us if we are too sick to come to class. Um, there are things that, you know, as somebody pointed out, doctors aren't necessarily going to write you a note for a cold or the flu. Right. People might be having a bad mental health day. 
Um, also, if people are ill, do we really want to add to that burden that they now need to be making phone calls to their doctor and potentially traveling to the doctor's office? That's a couple hours out of their day that they could have been home in bed, right? Yes, great point too that um, when women and people of color complain about pain or suffering or, or tell their doctor that they're experiencing pain or suffering, they aren't always believed. So it creates this barrier. So what can we do instead? What is a more flexible policy? Trust your students. And yes, just say, if you are going, if you are feeling ill and cannot make it to class, let me know. You can, I, because I teach online, record all my sessions. So I tell my students, if you can't come to class, I understand, let me know, because I notice you're missing. But watch the recording as soon as you can. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, if you're really concerned, you might, you can have students do a very brief makeup activity. You know, write, write me a short reflective email about what you learned when you talked to somebody about the notes from the day or you watched the recording. But we also um, wanna make it easy, yeah, to help students access the material that they missed. Mm -hmm. And also present class, coming to class is something that you assume students wanna do and make it desirable to come to class, right? I say to my students, I, we want you here because we want your voice. We miss you when you miss class. And I think it's a lot more fun to be in class because we have discussions, we have small group work. And if you're sick, you can watch the recording, you miss all of that, right? So I hope that you will come to class, but I understand if you can't. Um, Amy has a great point too. I know another student where the anxiety of missing school because of a chronic condition exacerbated the chronic condition. Right. So there was so much anxiety around missing school and makeup work and talking to the teacher that that actually made the chronic condition worse. So it becomes this it can become this cycle. And we want to keep that in mind, too. All right, let's unpack another one. And I'm going to pick something that's really timely, and that is requiring students to be on video in Zoom. So that is problematic for a lot of reasons. Why is that? And also I saw somebody asked for the link and I apologize, it took me a couple minutes, but there you go. That's the Google folder. So it becomes an invasion of privacy. We're, we're asking students to show us their personal space. And students may not be comfortable. They may want privacy in their home. Also, they may not live alone. So now we're potentially, as somebody just pointed out, invading other people's privacy. They may also feel like they can't control what their home looks like. If they're living with parents or roommates, they may not have control if somebody's walking in the background or if the house looks like a mess, right? So one is the privacy issue. Another issue I see a few people mentioning too is that it can be very uncomfortable to watch yourself all day. I have my camera on, but I minimize it so I can't see myself. Um, students in particular with uh, mental health issues may find it excruciating to watch themselves on camera. So why are we requiring it? It can also be very distracting for students with certain disabilities. So students who have an attention deficit disorder may find it very distracting to see themselves and other people on video. We also know that it, video adds to the bandwidth. So when everybody is using their video, we're adding to everybody's bandwidth. And some people have strong enough internet connections that they don't notice that, but other people find that it does interfere with their internet connection. We might also remember that in many cases, students are living in homes where multiple people are online at the same time. Um, I have a high school child. I have a college age daughter who is at home for the semester. We, throughout the week, have times where all three of us are on Zoom 
at the same time. Um, so even with a strong home connection sitting in a large metropolitan area, we have to be conscientious about what we're doing with our internet connection. My poor husband, during the day, it, we're like, you can't use the internet at all. <laughs> we get all the internet, you get none, <laughs> right? Um, so there are a lot of reasons to not require that students be on the camera all the time, and yet I see these requirements all the time. So what can we do instead? What can we do instead? Or if we really believe that we don't need to require people to have their cameras on, how do we talk about this with our colleagues, right? Um, so I really advocate that we just allow people to keep their cameras off. In fact, I teach in a graduate program and I don't, we don't use our cameras at all or we use them very selectively, I should say. Um, but I don't require that my students have their cameras on. Right, and then we look for other engagement strategies. Because often when I talk to teachers, what they really want is a sense of connection with their students because they're struggling when they've been forced online. And so I talk to them about how can we have a really active chat, right? So we look right now, we're all engaging in the chat. And I know how people are responding to what I'm saying because I can read the chat. We look for things like small group work. We look for things like Menti, Answer Garden, Google Jamboards, right? All these other ways that students can show that they're present and that they're engaging in the class and that we're getting that feedback. Again, lots of teachers want to see how students are reacting to the material. So how do we build in ways that we can engage with students, see how they're reacting to material, how they're understanding it, that don't require cameras to be on. Yeah, Veronica has a nice point about chat can become overwhelming. And that's a great point, again, as an accessibility issue that some students will find it distracting or they have difficulty extracting the really important stuff. So I do have some guidelines in my class that the chat has to stay on topic. Um, I have grad students, so they don't usually get off topic, but once in a while we sort of get sidetracked, right? And, and suddenly we're discussing cookies in the chat. And so I'll say, hey, this is a really interesting conversation about cookies, but can we save it until after class? Um, you know, I kind of laugh. I'm like, okay, we need to refocus. Like, let's all come back to what we're talking about today. Um, also, as an instructor, it can be helpful to reiterate really important chat points that you want people to take away or maybe pause for a little reflection and take away points. Absolutely. And we can balance that, you know, Brenna, to your point, um, so we can use chat and do some other things. Ophelia, Right, so Ophelia's question, what about allowing Zoom call-in? And sometimes I like to listen to meetings. I would say if that works for you, that people can just listen, that's, that's great. Um, I know in my classes with my students, I have slides and we do break into small group rooms. So I do say to my students that unless it's an emergency, I really need them to attend on a computer or a laptop. So they've got more functionality. Um, just listening doesn't work for my course. But I also think that that's a really good reflective point for all of us as we teach. What do we need, right? What, what's actually essential for learning? Um, and I should also say that I saw some people talk about synchronous sessions. My graduate courses have required synchronous sessions. That is how our program has been set up for 25 years. And so I have synchronous sessions, but I appreciate that point that they're not always necessary and maybe there are alternatives that people can offer depending on your circumstances. But it's a really good reflective point to think about what's really essential to my teaching. Right, and again, sort of how few policies can I potentially have? Um, so I saw that note about tips for the instructor and MG, that's a great question, but I feel like it's maybe a little bit of a tangent. So if we have time at the end, let's discuss it. How's that sound? Because it can be a lot. Um, 
And of course, we have 120 people right now, which is great. I love it. But it's also making a really, really fast paced chat today. And I know I've missed some stuff, unfortunately. Okay. Right, and Amy, and so then um, I should clarify, my policy with students is that if it's an emergency, if they're on the road, if they got caught on the train, which <laughs> happens to my students, right, and they can't get home, I'd rather have them log in on a mobile device until they can get to a real computer. But in general, um, I really want them to try and get to a, a real computer, right? So again, we're looking at flexibility and understanding that um, I trust my students to make those decisions, that they were on the road, they couldn't be home in time, they're going to log in on a mobile device. That's fine with me. I'd rather have them there partially than not at all, right? All right, so we've unpacked a couple of policies. I want to make time, sure we have a little bit of time for some more Q&A and discussion. Um, but also think a little bit about how we can encourage our colleagues and maybe ourselves. Um, I will say that my journey to flexible policies has been a journey over time. How do we kind of move toward those more flexible policies? This tweet that's on the screen now came out yesterday morning while I was putting the finishing touches and really thinking through this presentation. Um, and what it says is, I would like to see a series like Marie Kondo's tidying up, but for educators, the host would go into course shells and look for what sparks joy for the educator and students and then thank the rest for its service and get rid of it. <laughs> and then he ends with hashtag, what do you really need? It's such a great tweet, isn't it? I thought about it all day. What can we get rid of in our teaching that isn't sparking joy? Or the way I sometimes also like to think of it, that isn't supporting learning, right? If it's not there to support learning, can we get rid of it? Um, but throwing that idea out to the chat a little bit, um, you know, what can we do to support ourselves and our colleagues towards moving towards these more flexible policies? And I'm going to suggest a couple of things. Um, one is that we adopt an approach to teaching that is student centered and focused on learning. And I'm guessing I don't really have to tell the people in this audience that, right? But I think it's a great conversation to have with our colleagues um, where we really encourage people to think about the purpose of their policies and whether those policies reflect student learning. And a fantastic piece of writing on this is Ken Bain's book, What the Best College Teachers Do. Um, he has a whole chapter that really digs into issues around policy and he spends a couple of pages talking about late work um, and really saying these late work policies don't reflect the learning outcomes in the class, right? So what can we do? Um, we can also adopt the approach of empathetic and trauma-informed teaching. And I see that, um, I think Karina just gave us a link to an ACRL log post on trauma-informed librarianship. There's a lot coming out right now around trauma-informed teaching. And if you're interested in learning more about that or empathetic teaching, both of those are great words to do a search on, either just a regular Google search, and you'll find some great presentations and blog posts, or Twitter. There's some great people on Twitter talking about trauma-informed teaching. Again, it, and both of those take this empathetic approach of saying, uh, students are multifaceted individuals with multiple, multiple demands on their time and on their mental and emotional energy. Uh, trauma-informed teaching is really relevant right now as we're all going through this pandemic, right, and dealing with so many other um, challenges and mental health issues that our teaching should reflect. The way we think about teaching, the way we think about our students should reflect acknowledging that students come to us with trauma, right? Um, also, we should be listening to the stories of students and people with disabilities. Um, just listening to the stories we hear from students 
should encourage us to be more empathetic and to see how our students are multifaceted individuals with lots of responsibilities and challenges. Right. Um, and I would say if we want to encourage our colleagues to take this more empathetic approach, more student centered approach, we can also signal boost some of those stories on our own platforms um, so that we're calling attention to these stories and seeing students as really, you know, rich individuals, again, with lots of responsibilities and challenges. Um, and the resource list has some suggested readings to get you started and some people to follow on Twitter, if you would like. Not, I wouldn't say everybody on Twitter who's doing great work in this area, but some people that I follow and find are consistently talking about these issues. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely, Karina. So that leaves us with about 10 minutes left because I do like to finish up a couple minutes before the hour, five minutes before, I guess the half hour mark in our case for folks who need to um, get to another meeting and need a little break in between. But I wanted to open it up for Q&A and we can take questions in the chat. If people wanna hop on the mic, you can do that. And I don't think I have all the answers and welcome other people to respond to one another too. I have a question, Melissa. This is Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly. Hi. Um, so I have taught four credit courses um, and I've done kind of two extremes, one where I've, I've set deadlines and been really strict and one where it, it was very loose um, and, and, and forgiving.